What's up, everybody? Thanks for listening to the WhatCast. Mike, I hear we're going to get spooky this episode. Yeah, why not? I like spooky stuff. It's it's We're getting close to spooky season. Well, I guess we're in spooky season, aren't we? Yeah. As, as of this recording, it is midnight. So it is, it is officially October 1st. But you guys aren't going to hear this until, like, what, October 5th or something? Yeah. Maybe you'll get it early. I don't know. Maybe it'll be October 4th. Who's who's to say? You Only you will know when you hear this. Maybe you're listening to it late. If you're listening to it late, where were you? Why? why what took you so long? Bullshit. <laughs> but yeah, I got I got some uh, I've, I've got I've got some stories of. Uh, I, well, I don't want to say a haunted plane, but planes that were haunted as a result of. A plane crash so I, I i don't know i there's a lot of the old uh the old unsolved mysteries that i never watched this very well could have been on one i did not look to see and it's just now occurring to me that this would make a perfect episode of unsolved mysteries so uh, maybe it was if it was then we need to find it and we need to to do a watch along on patreon yeah but i it just it literally just occurred to me in this moment that it would make a perfect unsolved mysteries and if they did not do an episode on this then uh they missed out and and i know they did a a reboot of sorts for netflix but without robert stack it's just it's not the same it's that's not my unsolved mysteries <laughs> Didn't they try to bring it back? Like, and they ended up only being like one season or something. They did. Uh, I th- I think it was two seasons, um, or maybe it was just two parts. I don't know, but I think it was like four or five episodes each, and it, it was really good. Like the stories were good. The way they they did it was was good. But it's just you know, there's no Robert Stack. You don't have him narrating it, and and you know his very specific way of presenting things hanging by his neck in his fucking closet (laughs) robert stack (laughs) have you ever seen the movie killer bud oh god i probably have uh, i know which one you're talking about so i mean i think it's got bud bundy in it and uh yeah what's his name parker lewis can't lose but it had Robert Stack as like a special agent and it's fucking fantastic. It's, it's, that's, that's a, one of my, I, I don't even know if I want to call it a guilty pleasure movie. I just really fucking like that movie. It's so dumb, but it's great. But anyway, this isn't a show about Robert Stack unless really quick you can come up with any Robert Stack haunting stories. Cause if, if anyone has seen the ghost of Robert Stack, I want to do an episode. <laughs> <laughs> Just based on the ghost of so any any listeners out there, if you've had any experiences with the ghost of Robert Stack, please let us know, and uh, we will we will center an episode solely on you and your Robert Stack experience. But please please remember, this is not living Robert Stack experiences, ghost Robert Stack experiences only. Thank you. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> I, I have you ever heard of the the crash of Eastern Airlines Flight 401? I may have. It sounds familiar. So this was kind of a a, a weird crash that that occurred. Um, it was the the Lockheed, well, uh, you know Lockheed Martin, the military developer, but also they deal with. Uh, or they they make planes for for airlines as well. Um, so they came out with this new um, this this new plane or jet called the Lockheed L ten eleven one TriStar, 
And this was, uh, it was a new type of airliner. Um, instead of having the traditional four seats uh, across, this had eight seats. So it had a, a bank of four seats in the middle and then a bank of two seats on each side. And, you know, it was broken up like a regular plane would be with your first class and then your your regular uh, peasant passengers. Um, but this this was so big that it actually had two levels on the plane. So there was the, the main level where um, you'd have the pilot and his crew and, and the passengers. And then the lower level had obviously the, the luggage storage, but it also had um, a flight attendant lounge and a full kitchen down there that had uh, ovens and refrigerators and sinks, all that, you know, basically everything you would need in, in a kitchen. So, and, um, they, this was, a uh, these type of airliners were designed for, um, to fit a lot of people on, but they were equipped so that they would be able, people would be able to eat. They were, they were, it was more designed for long flights. Like you weren't taking this to fly to the next state. It was going to be, you know, like New York to Los Angeles or, Florida to Washington, so you know something like that. Um, but um, you know they they would go. They would they would take trips up and down the coast. Just it it was basically what I'm trying to say is it it wasn't for short flights. It was for for a long term flight. Um, you'd be in one of these things. So flight 401 was, I believe, the first of this type of of uh jet to actually uh go into public use and on the night of it was shortly before midnight on december 29th in 1972 there was a crash uh it crashed into the florida everglades the scheduled flight was to go they were coming from new york uh, JFK airport in New York and flying down to Miami International. Now, this was a new craft still at this point in time. So like everything got checked before they left. Everything was working fine. There was no big deal. Um, the, the flight crew was a very experienced flight crew. Uh, the, the captain was Bob Loft. He was ranked 50th in seniority, um, in all of Eastern airlines. So he was the 50th most powerful man in the, in the airlines. And he was the, the captain of, of this ship of this, I shouldn't say ship of, of this, uh, aircraft. Um, but he had been at this point, he was 55 years old, but he had been a pilot for 32 years and had accumulated a total of 29,700 flight hours throughout his career. Wow. And on this particular plane alone, he had logged 280 hours. So he was very experienced with the craft, a very experienced pilot, you know, trustworthy guy. To If I couldn't think of someone else, I'd rather have flying the fucking plane. You know, like this guy, this guy was a vet. He knew what was going on. Um, but he also had, uh, as his first officer, uh, a man named Bert Stocksill. Uh, well, his name was Albert, but he went by Bert. Uh, and he had 5,800 hours of flying experience with, he actually had more hours logged with this particular plane than Bob Loft did. Um, he had, 306 hours logged in on this plane and then they had um they obviously this is the captain and and his co-pilot or you know first officer they were in the cockpit also in the cockpit with them was uh the flight engineer who uh, his name was don repo and he had over 15,000 hours flying experience um, and still he he also had uh, 53 hours 
on this particular plane. So he was also in the cockpit. The the cockpit, I forgot to mention, the cockpit for this particular plane can seat four. I mean, typically the cockpit is is for just the pilot and the co-pilot. Um, but in the because this was so large, that also had an additional set of seats. Um so Don Repo was in there with them. And then they actually had another uh, technical officer who was at, he was off duty um, by the name of Angelo Donadeo. And he just happened to be returning back to Miami. He was working an assignment in New York. And the, I guess with um, if you work for an airline, if there's open seats, you can just get on get on the flight free of charge because you're part of the crew and so you can just get on and it's no big deal so in this case um technical officer angelo donadeo was off duty um, but he was allowed because of of his status he was allowed to uh sit in the cockpit as well so they they make the flight they get all the way down to florida um they've got 163 passengers on board and all told there were 13 crew members that were on board. Everything was going as planned, no issues whatsoever until they began to make their approach to Miami International Airport. They were coming in for the approach. They began to lower the landing gear and, uh, First Officer Stocksill noticed that the landing gear indicator for the front of the plane, the the you know the typically when you're looking at the landing gear, there's the two in the back and the one at the the nose of the plane, and the one at the nose of the plane, they weren't getting the green light showing up on their equipment that would indicate that the gear was properly uh, released. So they they tried it a few times. Pulled it in, lowered it, pulled it in, lowered it. Nothing, nothing changed. The light never lit up. So they they know that this there underneath the cockpit there's uh there's an access door that you can go in to get down to where to inspect the landing gear and and you're able to manually lower it from that area. So after cycling the landing gear and having the light stay down they radioed to the t- to the control tower at Miami International um, and told them they were going to discontinue their approach till they could figure out what was going on with the landing gear and they requested to enter into a holding pattern while they were investigating so the control tower cleared them to climb to 2,000 feet and they could enter a holding pattern over the Everglades so at their they enter into the holding pattern. They they go to put it into autopilot, and uh, while this was going on, they removed the light assembly in their equipment and put it. Ba- they put the bulb back in, and it still wasn't lighting up when they were hitting the the landing gear release. And then they ended up jamming the light bulb into the hole so like they they couldn't even at this point they couldn't even get it out if they wanted it was jammed in there so there was no hope to have that light up even if even if the landing gear was coming out so they sent don repo down into the bay underneath the flight deck um so that he could check in the port there's a porthole down there that would allow him to see whether or not the landing gear was down um so they're at the altitude of 2,000 feet, and 50 seconds after getting to the 2,000 feet mark, uh, Captain Loff put the the plane in autopilot. And according to the records that were picked up, for the next minute and a half, well, I, for the next 80 seconds, the plane maintained a level flight at 2,000 feet. Then it dropped 100 feet, and then it flew level again for another two minutes. And then it began to make a, a descent that was so gradual that the pilots didn't even notice that it was happening. Oh, like Over in the, the, every airplane video game? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And and the thing is, it was this is the middle of the night, and they're over the Everglades. Um, I believe the moon. It was either a new moon or it was like a, a crescent moon, and the moon, you know, wasn't illuminating the area, so everything was pretty dark. And they were kind of focused on talking to Don Repo and making sure he was, you know, taking care of things down there. So they, as they're making this gradual descent, this is when Repo went down below. And all of a sudden, the the chime that's on the equipment to indicate that they're dropping below safe levels, I guess. Altitude. You know, they drop. Yeah, yeah. It just, it starts going off. But the pilots were trying to communicate with Don Repo underneath, so they didn't even hear the chime going off because they were too busy trying to talk to him to figure out what was going on. And uh, within 50 seconds, the plane was at half of its assigned altitude. So it was supposed to be at 2,000 feet. Within 50 seconds of them... Like I said, it it dropped a hundred feet after the first minute, and then it started dropping two hundred fifty feet, and then within another fifty seconds, it was at a thousand feet. They, at that point, they noticed the discrepancy, and there was a a voice recording from the cockpit that was recovered from the crash, and the co-pilot. Uh, I'll, it's it's really brief, so I'll just I'll just read it. The co-pilot Stockhill says, "We did something to the altitude." Bob Loft responds, "What?" Stockhill, "We're still at two thousand feet, right?" Loft, "Hey, what's happening here?" Less than ten seconds after that exchange, it crashed. The microphone made a clicking sound, and then there were six beeps that were heard, which would be a radio altimeter. And then the sound of the initial impact, and then nothing. So when it finally crashed, it crashed uh, about 18 miles from the runway of the airport. And they estimated the plane was traveling at around 227 miles per hour when it hit the ground. Um, The aircraft was in mid-turn, and the left wingtip hit the surface of the swamp, and then the left engine hit, and then the landing gear, and then it crashed into the into the grass in the in the swamp fortunately there were there were survivors when they crashed there were actually two men who were out there they just happened to be spear fishing in the swamp and they witnessed the crash and ran to the rescue one of them ended up getting burns on his face his arms and his legs because there was jet fuel that had spilled after the crash and then it caught fire. Um, so there were parts of the the water that was burning because of the jet fuel. But he worked with surviving flight attendants to get the survivors out of the plane. 75 people survived the crash. So again, there were 163 passengers and 13 flight attendants. And then there were the, the four in the cockpit. Yikes. So all all together, um, there were 67 of the 163 passengers that survived, and eight of the flight attendants survived. And everyone had injuries. With the initial crash, a lot of the people died, but the survivors, uh, as they were being ushered out, they were they began to sing Christmas carols. It, you know, again, it was December 29th, so they just trying to keep spirits up. As a group, they were singing, trying to, in case any rescuers or any teams were coming to, to find them, they could at least hear them. Because at this point in time, the standard equipment on board one of these planes did not include flashlights. So they had no light whatsoever, and they're in the middle of the fucking swamp in Florida. Oh, shit. Yeah. Out of all the people in the cockpit crew, the only one who survived... Well, I shouldn't say the only one that survived, but only one of them died on impact, 
and that was uh, the co-pilot. He died on impact. Uh, Captain Loft died in the wreckage of the flight deck um, before they could get him out and get him to the hospital. So he actually died in the plane. Don Repo ended up dying later on. He was, he made it to the hospital, but he died from his injuries. Um, but they, the guest on board, Angela Donadeo, he was the only one who survived that was on the flight deck at that time. But when, when they investigated everything, it, it seemed like most of the passengers who died were in the aircraft's midsection. Um, the swamp itself seemed to absorb most of the crash, but because they're in the middle, when it broke apart, it, you know, it caused a lot of people to spill out and, you know, you're also going 200 something miles an hour crashing into the ground. So the impact's going to do, uh, do a lot of damage. But another weird thing was investigators believed that the mud from the swamp prevented people from bleeding to death. Like it, it packed their wound so that the, they didn't bleed out. But the downside of that is that the swamp mud caused infection and there were eight passengers that actually ended up getting gangrene as a result. Oh. Yeah, yeah. But all, like I said, everyone on board received injuries. Only 17 had minor injuries that didn't require hospitalization. Can you imagine being in a plane crash like that and just walking away? Not even, you don't even have to go to the hospital. You're just like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. It was a little, a little jarring, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be okay. But, uh, most of the injuries for the people that survived and ended up going to the hospital were broken bones. Um, some people ended up having broken spines and pelvises, but most of it was like ribs and legs and arms. And uh, 14 of the people ended up having burns as a result of the burning uh, jet fuel. But after they did the investigation, what they determined was that the uh, autopilot that had been set on, that they, they set on the thing to maintain... 2,000 feet was accidentally set to control wheel steering and when it's in this mode the pilot if he releases pressure on the control column the autopilot will lock in and it'll maintain the pitch that the aircraft is set at so what they think happened was when they were discussing with Don Repo about the possibility of going down that the pilot had turned in his seat and just slightly nudged the control column, causing it to make a gradual descent. But because the autopilot kicked on once he let go of the thing to maintain basically the angle of their trajectory, he didn't realize it because it was so gradual. And then they were so concerned with looking at the landing gear and figuring out what's going on with that, they didn't notice when the chime went off, letting him know that the they were losing altitude or that they were they were at a dangerous altitude. And uh, by the time they realized it, it was too late, obviously, judging by the the recording. But they another thing that they found was that there was nothing wrong with the landing gear. the The problem was with the bulb. The bulb was blown, and that's why it wasn't turning on. That was the only problem. The landing gear was fully functional. There were no problems with it at all. Wow. Yeah. It was cursed. A cursed flight, I tell you. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. It was... Finally, they, they... It was ruled as a pilot error because the crew didn't respond to the... to their equipment, letting them know that they were reaching dangerous heights and they needed to figure shit out yeah for sure it's their i mean like not to be a dick about it, how many people were in the the cockpit area the flight area four and yeah but in in defense two of them went down um don repo went down first and then donadeo went down with him and that's why they both survived because they went down but again don repo died of his injuries later um 
but that's the only reason he survived the initial impact was because of the uh they were below deck when it happened hmm yeah but i this is the what cast so we're there's a reason we're we're going into these this detailed description of of the plane crash there's a reason do you know what the reason is mateo something spooky it was barn owls oh yeah it was it was later determined in in after doing a thorough investigation of the engines that um there was tampering that was done and the tampering matched the talons of barn owls um so it wasn't cursed after all it was targeted this was a targeted attack by barn owls people those sons of bitches yeah yeah so with that that ends another episode of the what cast i hope you <laughs> enjoyed um i know the last episode was a little short so we wanted to you know extend this one a little bit for you so plane crash barn owls there you go more proof yeah yeah robot can you can you do a thing to get us out of here please thank you for listening to the what cast no i'm just kidding we've got more to talk about this I'm not going to leave you hanging again this week, guys. That's just, that's just mean. <laughs> so with, because this, this particular plane, um, or not this, not flight 401 specifically, but this type of plane was, was relatively new. A lot of these parts on the plane that had crashed were actually salvaged and were put into other planes. Um, which isn't out of the norm, I guess. Um, I mean, you got to keep in mind a lot of the this equipment and a lot of these parts are very expensive. So even in a plane crash, there's bound to be parts that still work or are still usable. You know, they that you can repurpose and then it'll it'll work just fine. Once these parts started be started to get put into other other planes it started, uh, there, there started to be uh, sightings or experiences that not only uh, the, the flight attendants, but the passengers also witnessed. And it started with sightings of Captain Bob Loft and uh, Don Repo. Which is weird that Don, to me it's weird that there would be sightings of Don Repo because he died afterwards right in the hospital you not on the plane but he but for some reason it's only these two that that people typically see um but usually what's witnessed with it, it's usually bob loft and he'll be he shows up like he's just kind of like living life um there was one time he sat down in first class and was talking to one of the uh, executives of of Eastern Airlines at the time. The Actually, it was the, the vice president. He appeared to him in first class, and the vice president didn't recognize Bob Loft as being, you know, a Bob Loft. He just looked, he noticed him as being a, a captain. So he sat down and was and was talking with him, and as they were in the midst of a conversation, Bob Loft just disappeared from where he was sitting and then just faded from view. Whoa, just totally vaporized. Yeah. And at first the VP thought that who he was talking to was just the captain from the flight he was on. But obviously when you got a guy just fading out, <laughs> there's something weird going on. So then he was shown a picture um, and he identified Bob Loft as as the guy in the picture. Wow. Yeah. But there for some reason that that seems to be like the the typical thing with these when when they show up. There was also a report from uh, the the crew that was loading the luggage that said Bob Loft showed up to them and was just talking to them like he was a pilot um, telling like they were doing the final inspections on the outside of the plane and he told him not to worry about it. He already checked it and everything's good and then walked out, walked away like he was still alive. 
he okay he told them to uh to not continue checking the plane because he had already checked everything and it was all good yep that's a little strange yeah um with this particular one the pilot of this flight when he heard about it from the ground crew um he got so freaked out that he actually canceled that particular flight. <laughs> He's like, nah, we're, we're not going down that road. But for some reason, so even though he shows up more frequently, Don Repo shows up. And again, it's, it's weird to me that Don Repo would be more frequent. Um, but there was a time that uh, one of the flight attendants were, were was working on a plane when she said she saw an engineer that was working on an oven in the in the bay. You know, I, I said it was the two level thing, and uh, down in the kitchen he was working on one of the ovens. And at the time there was only one engineer on the flight, so when the flight attendant didn't recognize this engineer, she went to talk to the other engineer to say, "Who's this guy?" And he said he wasn't the guy who was fixing the oven and. Um, he went to inspect it and he said there was nothing that even needed fixing on it. And there was no trace of this guy on the plane afterwards. Um, so at, after the plane or after the flight, the flight attendant identified Don Repo's photo as the engineer she saw working on, on the oven. Hmm. Uh, on another flight, there was a pilot who began hearing knocking coming from underneath the cockpit and so obviously worried that something's going on he opened up that hatch in the in the floor that that goes down to that compartment and as he looked down he sees Don Repo looking up at him and then they they made eye contact and then Don Repo just disappeared thinking maybe something had happened and and he misunderstood it the pilot actually went down into that area to look around and when he did he found he actually found a problem that was down there that would have caused an accident and potentially you know maybe a crash if it had gone unnoticed so in this case it was like Don Repo you know kind of warned him in in his own ghostly way hmm kind of intuitive for that guy to uh, head down there yeah I mean, most people would be like, nope, fuck that, close it. Right. <laughs> dude Dude just disappeared. Mm-hmm. Nope, not going to do it. That's crazy. Yeah, it's like, uh, there's a reason why I saw a disappearing man down here. Yeah. Yeah. There's one plane in particular that seemed to be the most affected by the hauntings for some reason, and it was TriStar 318. And this one had, it's had a lot of different, um, experiences. So they this one has also seen uh, Bob Loff as a passenger who will just disappear. Um, but the, there's also um, there was this weird situation where w- one of the attendants on this flight opened up the oven, and inside the oven is Don Repo looking back at her. Whoa. And she actually called in other members of the the crew to see him. They all witnessed it, and one of and the engineer who was on duty was a personal friend of Don Repo's while he was alive, and instantly identified him. What? Yeah. Um, according to everybody that was on board, Repo from the fucking oven warned them to be careful of the fire on board. There was no fire on board at the time. But uh, later on in the flight, there started to be problems with an engine. And those problems stemmed from a fire that no one knew about. So they had to do an emergency landing and canceled the rest of that flight because of the fire in the engine. Whoa. But it, there was a another case where there were two flight attendants who entered an area of the plane at the around the same time um, who experienced what we call the fear. Um, so the, the way that the story goes 
is one of the flight attendants was working on the, the main level with the passengers taking food and drink orders. And one was down below on the second level in the kitchen preparing food and drink orders. So after the flight attendant on the first level took all the orders, she went down to see her friend who was in the second level or you know the bottom level. As she's going down, her friend, who had just finished doing what she was doing, got in there. There's two two elevators that that go between the floors. Um, they run parallel with each other. So as one was going down, the other was going up. And so the first one gets down. She's looking for her friend, and she can't find her. She's looking all around. Um, she she gets this feeling that there's someone down there watching her. So she's anticipating that her friend is going to like jump out and freak her out, but it doesn't happen. And it gets so intense that she has to run out and leave. So as she's going back up. Her friend now is coming back down and then her friend goes down and she's looking and she has the same feeling thinking that her friend is hiding and is going to jump out and scare her at any minute. She's looking all around. She goes into the lounge area no one's in there. So she decides to go back to the kitchen, starts uh, bringing out the, the food and drink, or preparing the food and drink, I guess, um, like she had come down to do. And it got so intense that as she is preparing, she turns around and just keeps her back to the counter, you know, so there's just no possibility that anything's behind her. And she's fully expecting something or someone to jump out at her. And she said all of a sudden it got so intense that she just left everything and ran for the elevator and went back up. And when she gets back up, uh, one of the, one of the other flight attendants meets her and they like almost crash into each other and she's looking pale and she's sweaty and like, you know, flustered. Um, so the flight attendant she almost ran into is like, come with me. And she brings her over to where her friend was. And they both had experienced the same thing within minutes of each other. Just the the fear. They didn't see anything. They just had this overwhelming, oppressive feeling that something was there with them. And the longer they stayed down there, the more it intensified. And they just had to get the fuck out of there and and go back up top. And they felt safe up there. But it was just being down there alone for some reason. The fear took hold. Wow. Yeah, this case definitely sounds like a, an episode of Unsolved Mysteries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, I'm I'm gonna look it up right now. Yeah, I was gonna say I I would I would be shocked if there wasn't an episode of of Unsolved Mysteries on this case. No, there isn't. But but there is a made-for-TV movie called Ghost of Flight 401. Ooh. And it's available for free on YouTube. All right. Yeah. So just look up if specifically if if you this is exactly what the title says. It says Ghost of Flight Four O One and then in parentheses made for TV nineteen seventies. So if if you guys want to check that out, I can't vouch for it. I don't know anything about it. Um, but it's there. There may not be an unsolved mysteries episode. But there is a goddamn shitty made-for-TV movie, and I bet it rules. <laughs> and by rules, I bet it sucks, but it's probably still awesome. And then there's a, a book called The Mystery of Ghosts of Flight 401, and then in parentheses, UNSOLVED! I, I say it like that because it's there's an exclamation mark, so, so you know. But I already solved it. It was fucking barn owls, man. I, I already told you guys what it was. It's solved. Barn owls. They weren't ghosts. They were barn owls. And they used their their trickery to make people think they disappeared, but they did not disappear. They're still there to this day. <laughs> Sabotaging bastards. But the the thing with these hauntings was, like I said, they they use they repurposed um, parts from from Flight Four Hundred One on these craft. So the the planes that received these parts would report these these sightings, but. For some reason, 318 was the one that got the brunt of it. I don't know if it used more parts or I, I don't know what the deal is. But it got to the point where there were so many 
reports of paranormal activity on these planes that Eastern Airlines uh, started punishing people. Like they, they would say you'd get punished if you reported any of these occurrences. <laughs> um, they, they just they didn't want to hear about it anymore. Uh, and apparently, and the, I don't know how much of this is urban legend and how much is reality, but apparently um, once these sightings got bad enough, they took the the planes that had these parts and had the parts from 401 removed and replaced with new parts. And once that happened, the haunting stopped. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. So I got to ask you, we, we've talked a, a lot about ghosts on this show, and you've prevented a bunch of other theories of what these things could be, not just necessarily the spirits of people who have died, just like the, the traditional ghost stuff. Uh, what do you make of a case like this specifically? I mean, I'm, as weird as that sounds with Repo in that oven, I mean, what was he like, hey, Dave, I remember you. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, it's so weird that... uh like you open an oven and there's a dude and they're like, Hey, there's a fire. And you're like, Oh shit. Why are you in the oven? <laughs> D- don't worry about that. I'm in the fire. Yeah, it is weird. And, um, you, you know, uh, you know what else is weird? Part of the, part of this crashed craft is in the Lorraine's museum of the paranormal and whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah. They, they own a part of this cursed plane. Hmm. Yeah. But um apparently do you know who Brian Dunning is? No. He's like uh he's one of those like professional debunker guys. Like he's he's not he's not like our, our patron saint Joe Nickel. He's just like uh shits on everything. I think back in the day Joe Rogan actually had him on the show and, and he left in the middle of the show. Oh wow. Yeah, but um, he claims, and this is kind of a bullshit claim, and Brian Dunning is known for a lot of uh, bullshit, like like just like super simple answers without any real research being done as to what it could be. Just shoot from the hip, this is wrong because it doesn't make sense to me type of guy. But he claims that the origin for all of these stories of ghost sightings was a joke that was made by a captain for Eastern airlines after he had to do an emergency landing. And he made a joke that he thought Don Repo's ghost was on the plane because of how smooth the emergency landing went. And that is where all of these stories spawned from was that <laughs> joke. Hmm. So, you know, I guess it wasn't barn owls after all, it was a joke and everybody took it literally and got spooked. And that's, that's that. So multiple planes, multiple witnesses, multiple occurrences, all from a fucking joke. Wow. Yeah. So what do you make of this? I mean, interactions to where people are seeing them as clear as them being people that are there. Yeah. I I don't know. Like, these are the sorts of things that make me question what the fuck is reality. Right. Because it it doesn't... Because when you think of hauntings, like... This sort of thing doesn't, I mean, the the disappearing people showing up for like no reason, you know, the, hey, I'm sitting in a seat and now I'm disappearing. Like that sounds like classic haunting stuff. And I guess you could attribute that to like the, the stone tape theory thing. But I guess in this place it would be like the plain tape theory, like the their essence is part of that craft. So the parts of it have part of their energy maybe. But the ones where they're actually interacting and warning, that makes me wonder if maybe they have like some way to communicate across time and maybe their essence is there and part of them is, is like left over so they're able to interact. I don't know, man. It's 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 so hard to put paranormal activity in a nice, neat little pile. You know, like these things all they, there's just so many possibilities in in the world that they could in the universe that they could be that to just say yeah they're ghosts because they're dead and now they're seen again i don't think that's the case i think there's more to it than that 
Mm-hmm. And I don't, you know, I, I, it's, I don't think that it's really for us to understand how that shit works, but you, you hear things from people all the time when people die, um, they'll get like these little messages, you know, that, that seem like it could, you, you could explain it away as being nothing, but it has personal meaning, you know, like my, uh, my girlfriend's mom, when she died for like a week afterwards, we had this Robin that would just sit in our front yard and it would just sit there and we would come out and it would kind of like, it it just acted weird. Like it would start jumping and, and making noise and then it would fly up to the, the power line that was you know directly across the street from us so it had like a higher level to look down as and it would just sit there and it and anytime we would go out for like a week after she passed away it was there it was and then it just went away it wasn't there before she died it it literally showed up the the day after she died and was there for about a week and um my girlfriend actually went and saw a medium uh like probably a year after she passed and the medium said like I listened to the whole recording cause I'm very skeptical about mediums. Um, so I listened to the whole recording to see if she was, if, if my girlfriend was giving her any like sort of leads or anything. And she wasn't, she was, you know, just listening to what she was saying. She wasn't giving her any indication of who she lost or anything, but the medium told her that, your mother comes to you on wing on wings Hmm. and like it's such a random thing to to say and when we are when we had that suspicion about the bird like it it was just it was weird so like i i bring that up just because i i i feel like when you die I, i don't think that you are a ghost and i think that maybe you've got some energy that you're able to kind of leave little messages for your loved ones behind and and maybe over time that fades or I just maybe it's maybe it's my own misunderstanding or or my own ignorance of the way things work after you die but to me I feel like you've got a lot more going on after you die that that you don't need to you know you're not going to be sticking around there there's more going on and and it doesn't make sense like i know a lot of people say if you've got unfinished business or you know if you were wronged and you want revenge or but who doesn't have unfinished business at any given time you know if you died today any one of you listening to to this if you died today you would have some form of unfinished business no one is sitting there in their chair or their car or wherever the fuck you guys are no one, not a single one of you is sitting there being like, you know what? I am perfectly content with everything and there's nothing that bothers me and nothing left hanging. I've done everything I want to do and no, n- not a single one of you. If you say you are, you're a goddamn liar. <laughs> so either everybody's a ghost after they die or there's some some other explanation for what's what's going on. And maybe it's like a a time thing, like your energy is able to go through time and manipulate things in a certain way. Or maybe it's just you've got a limited amount of time after you die to, you know, work your energy on Earth before you go to the next. I don't know, man. I've never did. Well, maybe I did die. I, I, I do believe in reincarnation, but I don't. I personally, as Mike the Whatcaster, have never died. So... I can't tell you what happens after 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 you die. I promise you, you being you, Mateo, and also you, everyone listening, that if I die, I will come back and hunt all of you if I'm able to. <laughs> so I'll, I'll at least come in and punch your <laughs> punch, pinch your butt cheeks or or tickle your feet. You know, I'll oh okay, just listen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll slime you if you're lucky. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, Mike Slime Groose. But that's that's my promise to you, dear listener. If I'd wait, I need to make a caveat. It's only if I die 
well this show is still in production. If we aren't doing this show anymore and I die, then I'm not haunting a single one of you. No. Except for you, Mateo. You're getting your butt cheeks pinched daily, buddy. Ooh, I'll take it. Yeah, you will. You'll take it and you'll like it. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Get yourself a Whatcast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in Homie's page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.